collapse of the Roman Empire in the year 476 AD, brought about by the relentless invasions of barbarian tribes, ended a magnificent civilization that had dominated Europe for almost 10 centuries. And with this collapse, a new chapter of European history called the Dark Ages began that was to last almost 600 years. They were called the Dark Ages because during this era, the previous advances of civilization were reversed. A single unified European government was replaced by scores of small warring kingdoms. Roman cities and roads fell into ruin and disrepair. And the skills that had brought about Rome's great achievements in learning and art were lost. Now let us discover what happened in one small corner of the Roman Empire with the coming of the Dark Ages. Much of the modern country of Great Britain was once ruled from Rome, where it was known as the province of Britannia. When the Roman troops first arrived in Britain in the middle of the first century AD, it was a sparsely populated land inhabited by Celtic-speaking tribes called the Britons. Few traces remain of the ancient culture of the Britons, but mysterious stone circles, like the one seen here, are believed to have once been used by them as places of religious worship. As they had done elsewhere in Europe, the Romans brought civilization and rule by law to the native people of their new province. They introduced the Britons to the Roman religion with its bewildering array of gods and goddesses. And quite soon, the Romans began to construct towns whose new buildings mimicked the magnificent structures of their great capital city of Rome. Each new town had large public baths and markets and was provided with paved streets, clean running water, and excellent systems for drainage and public sanitation. And so it was that the Romans introduced a highly advanced culture to Britain, which became the northernmost outpost of Rome's vast empire. However, as time went by, the Roman Empire was increasingly subjected to attacks by outsiders, whom the Romans called barbarians, a word which in Latin means foreigners. Most of these barbarians came from the northern regions of Europe. They were poor farmers, organized into tribes headed by powerful warrior chieftains. The barbarians envied the wealth of Rome and the rich lands she possessed, and so they carried out violent attacks to destroy the powerful Roman army. In a very early attempt to keep the barbarians out of his empire, the Emperor Hadrian ordered that this stone wall was to be constructed entirely across the northern frontier of Britain. And for quite some time, Hadrian's great wall seemed to serve its purpose, for by the year 325 AD, nearly 200 years after the wall had been constructed, Roman Britain had experienced centuries of uninterrupted peace and prosperity and by then possessed four cities with populations exceeding 15,000. But right around this time, big changes were taking place all across Europe. Christianity was adopted as Rome's official religion. And seven decades later, in response to increasing assaults by the barbarians, the Roman Empire was permanently divided into eastern and western halves, each half being ruled by a separate emperor. As the ferocity of the barbarian attacks increased, Roman troops began to be withdrawn from Britain to help her defend her besieged provinces to the south. But in the year 410 AD, the great city of Rome itself was plundered by a tribe called the Visigoths. The capital lay in ruins, and the desperate emperor sent word to the citizens of Britannia that he could no longer provide for their defense. So at that point, the Roman province of Britannia ceased to exist.
after the year 410, without the presence of Roman troops, Britain became an easy target for the Germanic tribes from across the North Sea. And soon the barbarian invasions of Britain began in earnest. Tribesmen called the Angles sailed out from the southern side of the Danish peninsula and occupied the northeastern part of Britain. Another tribe, the Saxons, set forth from their impoverished villages in Saxony on the coastal plain of the North Sea and occupied much of southern Britain. The Jutes began their raids from the part of the Danish peninsula called Jutland and occupied other areas of land in the south of Britain separate from the Saxons. Finally, one other tribe, the Frisians, sailed to Britain from their homeland in Frisia, just to the south of Saxony, and became dispersed as a distinct group in the years that followed. These four tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, and the Frisians, have been lumped together by historians into a single group called the Anglo-Saxons. As the powerful Anglo-Saxon chieftains drove the native Britons toward the west, they set up separate kingdoms in a land that had known only unified Roman rule for almost 400 years. For the next few centuries, Anglo-Saxon settlers from across the North Sea built hundreds of new villages, many of them highly fortified, using the same materials and techniques they had used back in their homelands. And these new settlements made of wood bore little resemblance to the Roman towns they had destroyed. And so, by stages that can hardly be traced, the culturally advanced, well-ordered Roman world was completely transformed by the Anglo-Saxons. Now, let us take a closer look at how these Anglo-Saxons lived. Construction of this village called Stoa first began around 420 AD, about 10 years after the Romans pulled out of Britain. Stoa is located in central Britain, only about 30 miles from the North Sea. And by the time the Anglo-Saxons arrived here, this land had already been under cultivation by the Romans for several centuries. Stoa, like other Anglo-Saxon communities, was basically self-sufficient for most things, from food to clothing to household goods. For in the earliest days of their occupation of Britain, the Anglo-Saxons did not engage in the high level of trade that had centered in Roman towns and markets. And the same held true of religion, for the Anglo-Saxons followed the old Norse gods and had little knowledge of either the pagan Roman religion or Christianity. Stoa was a typical 5th century Anglo-Saxon community and was home to three or four different family groups, which included not just parents and their children, but could also include grandparents and great-grandparents as well. Within the village boundaries, each family group occupied its own mini-village, consisting of five or six buildings. These buildings were always roofed with a thatch of straw or reeds to keep out the rain. The walls were made either of wooden planks or woven branches and mud, called daub and wattle. And this technique of weaving branches also was put into use in creating baskets for storing grains and wool. This building, called the hall, was the focal point of activity for the whole village, and here a fire was always kept burning, both for warmth and to cook food. The hall tended to be a pretty smoky place, for it had no chimney so the smoke simply filtered up through the thatched roof into the outside air. Families gathered together here in the evenings or during bad weather to relax, share their evening meal, and the day's gossip. The outbuildings served many functions. Some were used for sleeping. Others served as workshops for various crafts, such as making shoes from leather, or making pots, jugs, cups, and other containers from clay. But the main activity of the village of Stoa was farming. Wheat, barley, and peas were raised, and these crops provided the vast majority of food for the village. Cows were also kept for the meat, milk, and leather they yielded. Sheep were also raised, 
and transforming their raw wool into cloth was another very important village activity. Much of the year, cloth making was an indoor activity, but during times of good weather, the cloth making procedures moved outside. Women would prepare special plant materials for dye making. And once the wool had been dyed, the next step was to spin it into thread using a spindle. Spinning was a time-consuming activity, but must have been a great relief from the back-breaking work of the fields. After the wool had been spun into thread, villagers often set up their looms on the outside wall of a house, and thus could enjoy the fresh air and sunshine while weaving the thread into warm woolen cloth. Besides making items of cloth, leather, and clay for use in the village, objects of turned wood were also created on these simple machines known as pole lathes. Foot power and the natural spring of a large wooden pole was all that was needed to turn the pieces of wood so they could be shaped into useful objects by a chisel. By the year 600, about 180 years after the village of Stoa was founded, the Anglo-Saxons controlled not just a large part of Britain, but one region of northern Europe as well, while at the same time, other tribes of barbarians had taken over huge areas of land. In the former Roman province of Gaul, another Germanic tribe called the Franks had seized control, and the name of the modern country of France reflects this Frankish heritage. To the southwest, the Ostrogoths had taken over the Iberian Peninsula and the foundations of modern Spain were laid. And a large portion of Italy was in the hands of another tribe called the Lombards. However, most of the territory bordering the Mediterranean Sea was still part of the Eastern Roman Empire and was ruled from its capital of Constantinople. While Rome, the fallen capital of the Western Roman Empire, was beginning to exert its influence once again, this time as the center of administration for the rapidly growing Roman Catholic Church. During the Dark Ages, three elements were joined together to create an entirely new pattern for Western civilization. These elements were first, the culture of ancient Rome, second, the Germanic peoples and their institutions, and third, and perhaps most important of all, the Christian religion. Christianity had all but disappeared in Britain when the Anglo-Saxons destroyed her Roman civilization. Because the Anglo-Saxons had their own religion, and because they tended to dislike anything that reminded them of the Romans, they did not readily accept the Christian religion. For this reason, Christianity was not successfully reintroduced into Britain until the end of the 6th century. At that time, there were seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in Britain. First, the King of Kent converted to Christianity. Then, one after the other, the kings of Essex, East Anglia, Northumbria, Sussex, Mercia, and Essex all converted from their worship of the pagan Norse gods to the Christian religion. And as the barbarian tribes all across Europe began to embrace Christianity, the Dark Ages started to take on a new flavor as a growing spiritual awareness began to accompany the need for constant bloody warfare. Although the castle we see here was built about 600 years after the death of Oswald, the first Christian king of Northumbria, King Oswald once lived in his own castle here around the year 630. Following his own conversion, the king wanted his subjects to share his new religion, and at King Oswald's beckoning, a monk named Aidan established what was to become a great center of Christianity on the island of Lindisfarne, 
located in the sea just to the north of King Oswald's castle, where today the stone ruins of a 12th century monastery stand. The first church that Aidan built on Lindisfarne was not of stone at all, but was a simple wooden building similar to the one seen here. Using a church like this as his headquarters, Aidan converted thousands of Northumbrians to Christianity. Some of these converts even chose to become monks or nuns themselves, rather than to study the traditional Anglo-Saxon arts of war. In this era, monks and nuns often chose to purify their souls by following lives of penance and solitude, and so to become worthy of entering the kingdom of heaven. The Anglo-Saxon monk named Cuthbert led just such a life. Not long after arriving at Lindisfarne, Cuthbert decided to establish a hermitage for himself on this tiny barren island in the bay just within view of the monastery. And here he lived for some time. But this hermitage was not isolated enough for him, so he moved to a different, more windswept island seven miles to the south. Here Cuthbert lived a life of prayer, penance, and isolation for nine years, and during this time is said to have performed many miracles. Whenever the rains and fogs let up, the new king of Northumbria, named Ecfrid, could just barely see Cuthbert's hermitage from the window of his castle. And so the king was constantly reminded of his powerful piety and devotion. Therefore, in the year 685, when it came time to appoint a new bishop of Lindisfarne, the king appointed Cuthbert, and under his leadership, many new churches were built throughout the kingdom of Northumbria. And although very few of those original churches still survive, the Anglo-Saxon church seen here was constructed during Cuthbert's lifetime and has served as a parish church in the tiny village of Eskom continuously for over 1,300 years. Eleven years after Cuthbert's death, it was discovered that his body showed no signs of decay, and this was taken as a sign that he was a true saint. Not long after his death, a monk named Edfrith honored the memory of Saint Cuthbert when he created this ornately decorated book called the Lindisfarne Gospels. Monks like Edfrith were known as scribes, and the richly colored books they created called illuminated manuscripts, are considered to be among the greatest art treasures of the Dark Ages. But they also serve as reminders that this was an era when only the monks and priests knew how to read and write, and nearly all the rest of the population, including the kings themselves, were illiterate. St. Cuthbert's body lay in a place of honor next to the altar in the monastery of Lindisfarne when, on the 7th of June in the year 793, this small religious community was plundered by a band of sea-roving Scandinavian warriors called Vikings. Just eight decades later, fear of Viking attacks finally forced the monks to abandon their monastery. But when they did, they took St. Cuthbert's body with them finally burying him where this great building called Durham Cathedral now stands. Eventually, so many Viking settlers poured into Britain that by the year 878, nearly one half of the Anglo-Saxon lands were called the Dane Law because they were subject to Viking laws. Just a short time later, in the year 911, the Vikings were given a huge area of land by the French to bring an end to the ceaseless attacks on their country. The conquerors named this land Normandy after themselves, the men from the north. The Normans established many small fortified communities like the one seen here. For the Dark Ages was a time of constant warfare between rival kingdoms. And at this time, most Europeans sought the protection these types of communities offered. The Lord, the man whose land supported this small community, was usually a mounted warrior called a knight. Because of their high status, 
The Lord's family usually lived behind an extra defensive wall in a large fortified house that usually had a stone tower attached to it. And within his private enclosure, the Lord kept a garden of vegetables and herbs for the use of his family. Inside the Lord's house was a hall where once a day a huge meal was served. And next to the dining hall was the armory where armor and weapons were kept under lock and key. Above the armory was the Lord's bedroom where he could enjoy a good night's sleep knowing that he was fairly safe from attack. The village located next to the Lord's compound was surrounded by just a single wall. But within the village enclosure, everything existed in order to keep the serfs who lived there well supplied in case war broke out. Here were the simple communal houses that, like almost everything else in the village, belonged to the Lord, that several families of serfs shared with their animals. And just like the Anglo-Saxon halls that came before them, these Norman communal houses were dark, smoke-filled places. Within the village enclosure, one would find a blacksmith who could make metal armor and weapons, as well as more useful items like axe heads and horseshoes. Grain was ground into flour here by pushing the grinding wheel around and around on a stone slab. Nearby, Bread was baked each day from that flour in the Lord's oven that stood right next to the kitchen building where the Lord's food was prepared. The bread, along with the wine and beer he produced in the brew house, helped to sustain the villagers. For extra food, the villagers raised all kinds of poultry, chickens, geese, and even peacocks. But only the Lord was allowed to have a dove cot, where flocks of doves were raised for the eggs, meat, and fertilizer they yielded. The Lord enjoyed dining on fish, so he raised carp for his table here in the village fish pond. Goats and even fallow deer roamed freely about the village and were also used for food. A protected source of water was very important during a siege, so every fortified village had to have a good well. Near the well stood the gallows where criminals were executed for a wide variety of offenses that would seem trivial to us today. But usually the Lord saw fit to leave the corpse hanging for several weeks to discourage potential lawbreakers. Not far from the gallows could be found the simple building used by the potter for making most of the containers and plates needed in the village. And just across the green from the potter's shed was another small building where the Norman serfs wove wool into cloth for garments and blankets. Right next door to the weaving house was the church where the village community attended mass and where many baptisms and funerals were performed. For during this era, it seemed that death was almost always present and the average person rarely lived to the age of 35. Beyond the village walls were the fields where the crops were raised that formed the basis of the community's wealth. And here the serfs labored long hours throughout much of the year. If the Norman lord who ruled this community was successful and his descendants gained in wealth and power, it is possible that this fortified wooden village might have been slowly transformed over the centuries into a stone castle like this. But even though rebuilding with stone was fairly common, it is much more likely that this Norman village would have remained pretty much as we have seen it. That is a well-defended village with a church and the Lord's larger house, plus about 300 acres of farmland that, taken as a whole, came to be known as a manor. Manors were the basic building blocks of the economy of the Dark Ages and of the High Middle Ages that were to follow them. The method by which manors were distributed was at the very heart of the social organization of the Dark Ages that was known as feudalism. For in this era, social status and wealth 
depended on the number of manors that one controlled. Let us see how the feudal system worked. At the very top of the feudal system was the king, who in theory owned every manor in the land. Because the king's power was based on the strength of his army, he found it necessary to grant the rights to huge areas of land that possessed many manors to his greatest allies. These were the high lords, the dukes and earls. Let us imagine that there are 700 manors in the entire kingdom and the king decides to keep 130 manors under his direct control and to distribute the remaining 570 manors among the dukes and earls. He decides to give each of his three dukes a dukedom containing 90 manors and each of his five earls who are of slightly lower status than the dukes an earldom that contains 60 manors. In return for the gift of his dukedom each duke is required to provide the king with 42 mounted knights. Each duke then decides to keep 30 manors for himself and distribute the other 60 manors among six lesser lords. So each will receive 10 manors. In exchange, each is expected to provide the duke with seven knights. To accomplish this, each lesser lord will keep three manors for himself and distribute the other seven manors among seven individual knights. Thus, in exchange for his occasional military service, each of these seven knights will receive not only the manor's lands and its buildings, but also the five or six families of landless serfs that will work the fields in exchange for the lord's protection and a share of the crops they raise. In the year 1066, a truly momentous event took place for the unified Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Britain, now known as England. For a force led by Duke William of Normandy invaded England and destroyed the army of King Harold at the Battle of Hastings. As a result, Duke William became the King of England, and so with the raising of the Norman flag, a new chapter of English history began. For as King William dispensed vast areas of manor lands to his most loyal subjects, they in turn began to build magnificent stone fortress homes for themselves. And soon these Norman castles were sprouting up all across the English countryside. And with them came thousands of fantastic new Norman churches and monasteries. It was clear to all that a great change had come the era of the Dark Ages, when the Anglo-Saxons had dominated England, was past. And a new, much grander era, called the High Middle Ages, was beginning to dawn, not only in England, but all across Europe as well. <laughs>